Hi guys, Lisa Archer here, nurse practitioner of my channel, NP Lisa Listens. Today's topic is about depression. As I'm sure you can imagine, um, that's been a real struggle for a lot of people, especially in the last year or two. Um, it's very much increasing and I see a lot of it in my practice. Um, if I haven't been having to increase dosages on their current medications for it, I'm having to start it. So I'd like to talk about um, the difference between depression as in you've had a sad event happen in your life, like a loss, and clinical depression, because there's a difference. And so depression can range in seriousness from mild temporary episodes, like I said, um, you know, you've lost something that you care about, whether it's a loved one or an animal you love, you know, a period of just sadness in your life. And then there's clinical depression, and this is a little bit more severe. It's, um, it affects our bodies. It's, it's our mood, but it, it's physical too. You know, I always tell my patients, I'm like, it's not just in your head, so to speak, right? It's, it's actually, you know, the neurotransmitters are off in your body, and um, sometimes we need a little more help than just talking about it, you know, and we'll get into the medications in a little bit. So um, now I'm a big believer in nutrition being part of health. And so I would like to say that there have been several studies that have found that people who eat a low quality diet, such as high in processed foods, um, processed meats, high in sugar, fried foods, refined cereals, and high fat dairy products, are more likely to show symptoms of depression. So I was originally gonna make this video about depression and anxiety kind of together, but I decided that, you know, really anxiety itself, they often go hand in hand. I mean, there's no doubt about it, but I wanna dedicate another video kind of just to the anxiety part of it, including panic attacks separately. So. Um, I'm going to start off with talking about three of the main neurotransmitters that kind of play a big part in um, depression and anxiety. So serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. So the first thing we'll start off with is serotonin. So when I talk to my patients about it, I tell them serotonin to me is kind of the, the happy hormone, if you will. So it functions as a neurotransmitter, which is a chemical messenger in the nerve cells of our brain. It's also in other parts of our body as well. It has a lot to do with um, not only our mood, but our digestion and um, just general feelings of well-being. So some things that we can do to naturally increase our serotonin levels is get exposure to sunlight. And if you don't really, if it's winter time or you're in a, um, climate where you know it's kind of gray and dark you can also try something called white light therapy which is something you can order and buy which tries to mimic natural sunlight and um, i actually have one myself and i've used it they recommend that you um morning time about 10 minutes of that white light shining on your face to kind of help mimic i guess a little bit of the sunlight right so, and there's, you know, there have been nutritional deficits somewhat linked to either low serotonin like vitamin B6 and vitamin D. And if you saw my other video on vitamin D, then um, you'll, you know, uh, remember how important it is to our bodies. So there is no single cause of low serotonin levels. Um, I mean, can it, it can occur for one of two reasons. Either we're not, our bodies are not making enough or our bodies just can't efficiently use what we already have in our body. So, um, so I'd like to talk about, so serotonin is, you know, it sta helps to stabilize our mood, our feelings of well-being, and just kind of general happiness. So there are some medications, you know, that can help with lifting our serotonin um, levels. So I, like I said, I'm very into um, natural ways of doing this, but there are times when, you know, I have patients come to me and they, it's just, 
Their depression is so significant that they're really having a hard time functioning. They're unable to work. It's affecting their relationships. Um, you know, that maybe we need to go ahead and introduce a medication. And, you know, a lot of times they'll ask me, they'll say, is this something I'm going to take for the rest of my life? I mean, and they don't want to do that. And, you know, I understand that. And I just tell them, I'm like, you know, you need it when you need it. And then when you don't, we'll talk about getting off of it. I mean, it's, you know, there is a time when you could. And we just have to taper off. And that's another topic. But anyway, so that's kind of the serotonin, all right? So I'm going to bring in another one um, called norepinephrine. So it's also known as noradrenaline. And it works um, kind of similar or hand-in-hand -hand with adrenaline, which is our kind of fight or flight hormone um, and it is also acts as a neurotransmitter to uh, as a chemical messenger between the nerve cells in our brain as well so it can help mobilize the brain for action and improve our energy and attentiveness so there are medications for depression that instead of just working on serotonin only they actually work on serotonin and norepinephrine both and i will go through some of those um, names of some of these meds in a little bit. So, you know, what I find in my practice is that when I'm talking to my patients about depression, I ask them, I say, well, let me talk about kind of how it feels or how it could feel. And um, guided by the answers to my questions helps me to kind of choose maybe a good medication to start with. And my general practice is I don't like to start anybody on anything that's, you know, too high of a dose. I, I like to start low so they can get an idea of how, um, if they liked it or not. Because like I tell my patients, you know, we're all different. I mean, we're all very unique and what works great for one won't for another. So hopefully we'll hit, we'll hit it out of the park right off the bat. Um, but if not, I encourage them to not get discouraged. So some of the questions I ask are kind of how depression feels. And um, I know this because from personal experience, actually, I became clinically depressed during the second trimester of my pregnancy. And, um, you know, excuse me, you would think that working in the medical field, I would recognize it, but I didn't. So I found myself, I couldn't work. I couldn't, um, everything felt gray. That's the best way I can describe it. Um, there was no joy in my, you know, th normal things in life that would make you feel joy. I just, I didn't feel it. And I couldn't work, I'd be at work and I just felt like I had this gray cloud over me and I just couldn't do it. I had to go home. So um, I remember feeling miserable in my own skin. I mean, it was not a pleasant feeling. And any kind of, something very notable about depression, um, it's interesting is that feelings of guilt, they're very magnified. Like any past thing you think you ever did wrong or bad or could have done better is so magnified. And you're like, this may be something you haven't even thought about in years, but for whatever reason, you know, it's, it gets on your mind. And um, some people can't sleep. They have really bad insomnia. Um, and then it could be the flip where they just want to sleep all the time and there, it's very hard for them to motivate themselves to get moving. In my case, I had the horrible insomnia. I couldn't sleep. My mind was going a million miles a minute. Um, I lost my appetite completely. I didn't want to eat. And of course, you know, you can imagine being pregnant. That's not a great thing, right? So... I think I went without eating for about three days. The thought of food was just such a turnoff to me. I felt like everything I ate was like cardboard or just gross. So, um, and then on the flip side of that, some people may feel the opposite, right? They just want to eat all the time. They're eating their feelings, so to speak. And so these are the questions I ask my patients, you know, how are you experiencing this? You know, are you feeling more of no sleep? or too much sleep? Are you feeling no appetite or, you know, you want to eat, just eat, 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 eat. Mm -hmm. So that kind of helps guide me towards the medication choices I might make for them. So speaking of the medications, so let's talk about 
Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me back up. <laughs> Let's talk about dopamine. Dopamine is the third neuro neurotransmitter I want to address in this video. So it is also another hormone that acts as a neuro, uh, neurotransmitter, which is the chemical messenger, again, as I said, between um, the nerve cells in our brain. So um, when I say feel good hormone, dopamine has a lot to do with our reward and pleasure centers in our brain, right? So it's also, um, so serotonin is the mood regulator, but uh, dopamine is again, the pleasure center, the reward. So in moments of time where we feel pleasure or reward, that's a dopamine rush, okay? And so dopamine has actually often been, um, uh, correlates a lot with addic addiction in general, you know, things that we get addicted to. So going, okay, so now uh, that's it. Serotonin, nor norepinephrine, and dopamine, right? So I'm gonna go through the medications and kind of talk about how I choose something for my patient, like where I start, right? So um, if, if there's an antidepressant that's gonna work just on serotonin, they're called the SSRIs or uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And what does that mean? Well, that means that the way the drug works is it's going to help the serotonin to stay in the brain, if you will, a little bit longer before it's taken up and metabolized through the body. So some examples of that could be Celexa, also called citalopram, um, Lexapro, also called escitalopram, um, uh, Luvox, fluoxiv fluoxivamine, you can't pronounce these words very well. Anyway, I'm, I don't use that one very often, so excuse me, bear with me. Uh, Paxil, Paroxetine, Prozac, which I'm sure a lot of us have heard about, Fluoxetine, and Zoloft, which is also called sertraline. So if I have a patient who tells me that they're very anxious and they can't sleep and they just, their mind's going a million miles a minute and they're having a very hard time motivating and dragging themselves out of bed. You know, they're very, they're very low. Um, they just, they're very anxious. That's the thing. They're very anxious, right? That seems to be how their depression's manifesting. Then I might actually start with an SSRI to kind of calm them down, right? Like be a little bit more tranquil. And um, so, which of course, anxiety, which I'm gonna do in another video, uh, I would choose this, this class, if you will, first of all. Now, with that being said, all medications, all drugs have potential side effects. And this is what I tell my patients. I'm like, you know, potential is potential. I mean, are you gonna have the side effect? You might. Are there some side effects we don't really want to have? Of course, but you know, you have to weigh the risks and the benefits. If this person can't function and they can't go to work and they, it's really affecting their life, then we need to go ahead and kind of get that to a place where they can, and then we can address the rest down the road. So going into the next uh, neurotransmitter I talked about was the norepinephrine. So again, this is relating, relates to the adrenaline in our bodies. So that's our fight or flight. Um, so it's a little more of a pick you up. Now they do have a drug class called the SNRIs and that's serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. So they're actually working on both serotonin and norepinephrine. Um, you don't have as many of those as you do the SSRIs, but some examples of those could be Cymbalta or Duloxetine, Effexor or Venlafaxine, Fet Fetzema or Levonisipran, excuse me, these words are hard to pronounce, or Pristique, uh, Desvenlafaxine. So another thing we've seen with, the, with this particular class of medications is um, for some reason, they seem to also help some people with chronic pain, um, fibromyalgia, um, neuropathic pain, which some diabetics experience, like a pins and needles type of a pain. So, um, you know, they, they can help with other things more than just your mood and depression. So if I have a patient who's, you know, experiencing depression and maybe they also have chronic pain issues and stuff like that, 
I might choose this drug class. And again, do they have potential side effects? Yes, all, all medications do, everything does. Um, but we have to weigh the risks and the benefits. And so then that brings me again, finally to dopamine, which I talked about earlier, our reward pleasure center. So we know if I'm talking to a patient and they tell me, um, I'm, it's hard to get moving. I'm just low motivation. I just want to eat all the time. I, I can't get out of bed. I can't go to work then I'm going to look at probably a norepinephrine dopamine type of antidepressant because I want to kind of increase their energy, lift them up. This is a little different than what I said previously. If someone who uh, is very, very anxious, then they need something a little more calming. Okay. So, um, oftentimes one of the, uh, antidepressants that is the dopamine no, uh, norepinephrine um, neurotransmitters it works on is Welbutrin, also called bupropion. I actually use it quite frequently and sometimes I found that I may even need to use a SSRI in combination with uh, Welbutrin. You know, you can do that. You can bring them both together because one thing that the Welbutrin is so different than a lot of the other antidepressants is, unfortunately, unfortunately, a lot of the other antidepressants drug classes can, for example, cause sexual side effects. Either somebody has, it decreases their libido or they have their libido, but they have a hard time reaching an orgasm. And if somebody is sexually active and they're in their relationship, I mean, this is not a side effect that they want, right? I mean, understandable. So if that's the case, I may actually add in a low dose of a Welbutrin to see if it counteracts it because Welbutrin can sometimes help people actually increase their sex drive and their energy. Um, they've also found that Welbutrin can help with some people with um, stopping smoking and um, ADHD. So do medications have their place? They do. Do I think nutrition is important? Absolutely, totally important. So, um, you know, examples of, um, it's kind of common sense you would think, right? Like just decrease processed foods, don't eat a lot of fast food, um, you know, not too many processed uh, meats, fats, things like that. Um, good sleep, I mean, honestly, really good sleep does so much for us, even more than we realize. And another thing I like to talk to people about besides just drugs, because that's not my first choice. I mean, we are, we are an entire human being. We're made up, we're, we're mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual. And I think we need to address all those aspects of ourselves to find the best plan to help somebody feel their best. So, I often talk about meditation to my patients, visualization, um, breathing exercises, healthy nutrition, and um, we, we'll go a little bit more into that when I go to the anxiety uh, video. Um, you know, but I tell my patients there's uh, plenty of free meditation videos on YouTube. You can choose guided or just play meditation music and you can start off with five minutes a day. And the goal of meditation is to just kind of become thoughtless. And that may sound easier than, that may sound easy, but it's not, okay? So they've done studies and they've shown that we probably have over 65,000 thoughts running through our brain all the time, running around oh, monkey mind, right? That's what they call it, a monkey mind. And so med what meditation does is it helps you through practice. I mean, it's discipline and practice. You just keep doing it to become thoughtless. And um, you keep that going and then it gets easier and easier to be in control of your mind because oftentimes our mind and our thoughts are kind of dictating our body and how our body feels and how it's reacting. So, um, yeah, so this is an introduction on depression, and um, I hope that helped. So stay tuned for the next video, which we'll be talking, focusing more on anxiety. And like I said, anxiety and depression often go hand in hand. They're very much related, 
but I want to I want to dedicate a, another video to just kind of anxiety and also focusing on panic attacks because I also deal with that in my practice quite often. So, um, you know, and just, I'd like to finish with this. You know, I tell my patients, you know, when, you, when you're experiencing clinical depression, um, you know, it's not, like I said in the beginning, it's not just in your head, okay? You're not just going crazy. Um, it is a chemical imbalance in your body and how it's affecting your brain. And one thing I do like to tell them is don't give up hope and, one one line I'm known for saying to people is, is I say, I'm going to tell you something and it's going to sound simplistic, but I want you to think about it because in a way it is profound. And that is nothing is permanent. Nothing. What does that mean? That means that in, in this particular case, you can't feel this bad if you try for the rest of your life. It's not going to happen. This is not permanent. And I know it feels like it. And I think that's a lot of reasons why, unfortunately, people who are clinically depressed think about suicide um, because they, they think, oh my gosh, like I cannot feel this bad for the rest of my life. I just can't, I can't, I can't handle it. And that's why I like to, to let them know this isn't permanent. Nothing is permanent in life. It's not. Everything is change, 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 and it will get better. And um, I tell them too, if you ever have thoughts of suicide or whatever, please understand that those are not normal thoughts. That's related to the neurotransmitters that are just off in the brain and we can get that fixed. And if you do, I give them the mental health crisis line and I encourage them to please, if you feel you're having those thoughts and you're thinking about taking action on that, then please do call the mental health crisis line because that's what they're for. So I hope this helped. And I look forward to uh, the next video talking about anxiety and panic attacks. And I hope that this information helps you. And if you have any questions or comments, you can leave them below. And I appreciate it if you um, ring the bell, I think they say, and uh, subscribe. And if you have any other topics or things that you're interested in learning more about, I'd be happy to re read about it and share those with you. All right. That's it for now. I hope you all have a wonderful weekend to your health. Bye.